Watch this. One ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court could cause a lot of dominoes to fall across the country when it comes to a woman's right to choose. Idaho is one of those states and is now trying to add another layer of criminalizing abortion. The state Senate takes up a Texas-type bill where families could get involved. Kids having access to obscene and pornographic books would be a problem for most parents. One lawmaker says it's becoming a problem in our libraries. But is it? We asked the local librarian how they decide what gets put on the shelf and what doesn't. Our lieutenant governor choosing to take part in a controversial alt-right conference continues to ripple through our community. It's a bell that can't be unrung for a local rabbi, ironically. Once again, Idaho is getting some national attention, this time from a vote at the State House, as senators approved a Texas-style abortion bill that would allow a doctor to be sued if they perform an abortion after cardiac activity is detected in a fetus. And the list is long of those who can sue the doctor. Sisters, brothers, moms, dads, any immediate family member of the woman who had the abortion. This is just another level of criminalizing abortion after Governor Little approved a fetal heartbeat abortion bill or abortion ban about a year ago. Joe Paris walks us through today's debate in the Idaho Senate and the qualifiers the new legislation has before, it ha or has before going into effect. On the topic of abortion, the Idaho Senate made a major move to add on to the 2021 fetal heartbeat abortion ban. Senate Bill 1309 <laughs> updates last year's legislation to include the private enforcement mechanism modeled after the Texas Act. In short, the legislation allows certain family members of a pregnant woman to file a lawsuit against an abortion provider who performed an abortion on a woman after a fetus has a detectable cardiac activity. An important note, Senate Bill 1309 only goes into effect if another state with a similar law has it upheld in court. As expected, debate on the Senate floor included emotional arguments from both sides. Critics on the Senate floor highlighted issues with family members becoming the enforcement of the legislation. I'm sorry, I like a lot of my family members, but there are several of them that we don't agree on health care issues. And I wouldn't want them weighing in on what I should be doing with my own personal health care. Supporters of the bill said it was imperative to protect life, specifically life that cannot defend itself. If it is not alive, why does it require outside intervention to terminate it? And since it has its own DNA, its own circulatory system, and often of a different blood type, sex, or even race different from the mother's, it cannot logically be considered the body of the mother. Lawmakers went back and forth, debating merits and value of the legislation. It doesn't represent Idaho, and it surely doesn't represent the hundreds and hundreds of constituents in my district who have contacted me, as asking me to vote no. It grieves my soul greatly when I hear God's greatest creation, which is his children, referred to as a clump of cells. And I don't care what stage of development that is, a life in reference to the abortion laws in Texas and those being considered by the Supreme Court, some lawmakers raised questions about the legislation even being constitutional. Others argued it's a gray area worth risking it for. We're going to have a, a Supreme Court ruling from the federal government, and we got some time. That's soon. So if we'd have to remodel this if they're depending on the ruling. But I think we should wait and see what the ruling is. I think this is a little bit too quick. The tentative constitutional status of the Texas law makes it unclear as to what the law of the land really is. Until that decision is finally made, let's take advantage of this opportunity to halt the slaughter of the unborn in Idaho. As debate concluded, both critics and supporters made powerful emotional arguments. I am adopted. And if it was not for my mother's decision not to have an abortion, I would not be here. And we are here today as a body to be that voice, to be the voice of those that cannot speak. The bill itself feels violent to me. It feels like an attack on me as a human being, able and capable of my own moral decisions about my body, 
now a government agency, the whole state of Idaho, enabling my family to come after me if I make a choice. And I think we hear that a lot and have heard that a lot, uh, the my body, my choice, and how that's been co-opted in no matter what aspect, even when it comes to the pandemic. Aside from that, is this a copy paste of the Texas bill? Uh, there's some questions about that. The short answer, Brian, is no. This is not just a copy paste of what's going on in Texas. There are some actual major differences between the law that's proposed here in Idaho, still has a ways to go, and what is law in Texas. Idaho's law does include, it does include, I should be clear, an exception for medical emergencies, rape and incest. Texas's law just does not have those exceptions. Now, the Texas law also allows people to sue other people other than the person, the doctor who performed the abortion in the state of Texas. Texas, for example, if you were to drive a woman to an abortion clinic, you too could be on the hook for being sued under the civil penalty in the state of Texas. So in Idaho, it is just limited to family members suing the person that performs the abortion. So some major differences uh, between what's going on in Idaho and Texas. But the bottom line is that the Supreme Court and major courts are going to have to decide this. So it is wait and see. It is. And as they said, well, why not take advantage of it while we wait and see? All right. Thanks, Joe. Over on the other side of the building, on the House floor, another debate. This one had to do with drug testing for substitute teachers. Representative Judy Boyle of Midvale introduced the bill last week. It would ban anyone who failed a drug test from working as a substitute teacher in Idaho for a full year. If that person failed three times within three years, well, they'd be banned from working in any Idaho school district for five years. She said she understands schools are having trouble, especially right now, finding substitute teachers, but that kids should be kept safe. She also said in committee, Becoming a substitute teacher was an easy way to get into schools and sell drugs to kids. Those against the bill say that this is just another burden in getting people to fill in to help fill the, or help those teachers and fill in those spots. Representatives from some Idaho school districts testified in committee. They already require some form of drug testing. But right now, any potential substitute teacher does go through a background check before being allowed to work in a school. The bill, however, died in a close vote on the House floor 31-38. So age appropriate materials are something parents expect from public schools, public libraries, even museums. But at least one lawmaker says she is seeing more obscene and harmful materials on the shelves of those places. Enter House Bill 666, a bill that would provide or prohibit, I should say, schools, public libraries and museums from distributing obscene material to kids. You may be thinking, isn't that already not allowed under Idaho law? Yes, but obscene is a subjective thing and public schools, public libraries and museums, well, they're exempt from this law. So appropriately numbered House Bill 666 wants to remove that evil exemption. Katya, how would this bill change things? Well, Brian, this morning in the House State Affairs Committee, public testimony was most specifically focused on public libraries. And while some parents say this bill would prevent kids from reading sexually graphic texts and books about the LGBTQ experiences, librarians say this opens up the opportunity to criminalize their staff. Well, likely this is inadvertent. The increasingly frequent exposure of our children to obscene and pornographic materials in places that I, as a parent, um, assume are safe and free from these uh, kinds of harmful materials is downright alarming. Somewhere there is a spigot turned on allowing all sorts of questionable books to be purchased, and parents are starting to notice. We walk down the slippery slope of censorship of constitutionally protected speech when we have a bill like this. And we should point out that there is still confusion over whether this bill would criminalize librarians or library workers for letting kids check out what some consider to be an obscene book. Now, the bill passed out of committee along party lines. It now heads to the full house. But we wanted to know, are these books actually on pu public library shelves that contain, quote, obscene or pornographic material in these children's sections? So we reached out to the Ada County Community Library, Ada County Library, rather, to have them explain how books are selected and eventually put onto these shelves. It's actually an elected board. So it's members of the public who file just like a, you know, a senator or a congressperson would file for office. Our library board members are made up of community members and there's five of them. So part of the library board policy, the array of policies that we have, um, is one called, in our case, it's called the policy for selection or selecting and discarding materials. It's a policy that is set by the library board and designed to guide um, 
pretty much the entire process from selecting books to add to the collection. Instead of this bill, we would like to see people engaging with us on a, you know, in a community level. We don't see a need for this bill and we certainly do not need, see the need to criminalize library staff. Now, DeWalt says most libraries offer reconsideration forms if a community member wants to share feedback about a certain book and whether or not they feel it should be on library shelves. She says that people can do that. And they, she says there were a couple of times where books were recategorized, for example, from maybe a children's to the teen section in her experience, but she's never had to take a book off the shelf for being, quote, obscene. Now, DeWalt added that all library branches are, of course, different, and the books that they carry cater to that specific demographic. So one book may be available at one branch, but not another. Again, she thinks this bill is unnecessary, like you heard, and she says issues that come up could easily be resolved by communication with community members, Brian. And as you said, instead of criminalizing it, which is a good question, you could just get involved and be on that library board to help make those decisions for everyone. Yeah, and especially have a parent present, you know, while their child is looking for a book. And like a lot of these things, whether it's school boards or library boards, yeah, it's all about that community involvement. And if you see, see there's a problem, then maybe you want to take that up and get involved yourself. All right, thanks, Katya. Idaho's lieutenant governor says her appearance at a conference organized by a known anti-Semite is being overblown. Not if you ask those in the Jewish community who've been blown away by her lack of consideration, considering what she did a month earlier. All right, don't forget, this is the time to get involved in the 208 conversation. Grab your phones and text this number, 208-321-5614. Send us your questions and comments and even complaints about the show. Just make sure you include your name in the hashtag the 208. That way, we know who to blame for bad spelling and grammar. There's another layer to Idaho's lieutenant governor appearing at a conference held by known white nationalists and anti-Semites. Last week, the America First Political Action Conference, or AFPAC, played a video message from Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan. AFPAC was organized by Nick Fuentes, a known anti-Semite, Holocaust denier, misogynist, white nationalist, who's been kicked off of various social media platforms for his views. The conference featured several others who share Nick's far-right and anti-Semitic sentiments. When asked about it this week, Lieutenant Governor McGeehan claimed she did not know anything about Nick Fuentes. And besides, who cares what he has to say? Well, a lot of people do, like Idahoans who happen to be Jewish. Ironically, the other layer of Lieutenant Governor choosing to be part of this conference has been laid bare by our own Jewish community. Rabbi Dan Fink has been the leader of Beth Israel Congregation since 1994. So he's been kind of the go-to guy when it comes to things like Jewish holidays, traditions, and unfortunately, anti-Semitism which might explain why Lieutenant Governor McGeehan sent him a letter back in January asking for his help in defining and dealing with anti-Semitism in the gem state. She would welcome, she wrote, the opportunity to assist with any task force developed to fight anti-Semitism in the city of Boise as well as throughout the state of Idaho. 
She included a letter she sent to Governor Little back in October and an interview she did with the Intermountain Christian News as evidence of her sincerity. But Rabbi Fink says the letter was pretty vague and didn't appear to lay out any sort of plan, just that if there was ever a task force created, she would like to be a part of it. Rabbi Fink says his first inclination was to respond, well, in anger, as in the nerve of the lieutenant governor had to invite him to a conference on anti-Semitism, he told us today, when she courts far-right extremists whose ideology is rooted in anti-Semitism, he said. But because the Talmud tells us we should judge people with an inclination towards innocence, Rabbi Fink says he took a couple of breaths and a couple of days to write a brief response and hand deliver it to the lieutenant governor's office on January 25th, basically saying, I appreciate the invitation, but there's some things we need to talk about first. Well, 10 days passed and he heard nothing from the lieutenant governor. So he says he wrote another letter, this one a little more thoughtful, a little more to it, a little more critical of McGeehan's original invitation, but still with the invitation to have a conversation about these concerns that he was having. Rabbi Fink says this whole postal correspondence came to a hypocritical head last week. There were a number of things about it that troubled me. You know, first and foremost, the, her, her invitation was a kind of rant uh, against the political left. In her letter, Rabbi Fink says Lieutenant Governor McGeehan defined anti-Semitism as anyone who was critical of Israel. But he says that's not how he sees anti-Semitism playing out here. You know, the anti-Semitism that we're dealing with in this state is overwhelmingly from far-right white nationalist groups. Failing to mention that faction, Rabbi Fink says, her letter seemed profoundly unbalanced and political by also claiming Governor Little failed to condemn anti-Semitism. So it became very clear to me reading her letter that she was really looking to use anti-Semitism as a kind of wedge issue in her political campaign uh, against the governor. So I, I wrote all of that in my letter. I, I sent it off uh, and heard back nothing for a month. And then Rabbi Fink received this in the mail, a longer letter from the lieutenant governor, but one basically asking the same thing. Can we join to define, expose, and call out anti-Semitism? But it was also completely tone deaf to the concerns that I had raised in my, in my letter to her. And the I letter arrived February 25th. I'm Janice McGeehan, Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Idaho. The same day, McGeehan appeared virtually at AFPAC. And keep up the good work fighting for our country. You know, the, the contrast between the act of sending a letter to a rabbi to say, I want to help you combat anti-Semitism and going to speak to this group was so incredibly jarring. The dissonance was so extraordinary. Uh, I both hurt and at some level had to laugh because it was, it was surreal. What does that make you think about her intentions or what this is all about? You know, there's a teaching in my tradition uh, which is to say, what you do counts a lot more than what you say. You know, to me, uh, her invitation is, is farcical because I want to, we judge people by what they do in the world. And you are the company that you keep. Uh, she wasn't coerced to sending a message to that group. And it was either unbelievably ignorant to not know who they were, or she knew who they were, which is what I strongly suspect, because who, who, who accepts an invitation to, to deliver a message to a group without having any idea who they are? The, the word I would use is chutzpah, <laughs> that you would have the chutzpah to reach out to me and say, help me on anti-Semitism while going out and glorying in <laughs> the presence of anti-Semites is extraordinary. That's how this struck me. We did reach out to the Lieutenant Governor's office today to see if she had any comment about where, what Rabbi Fink has said about this invitation that she supposedly sent to him. We have not heard back from her. Rabbi Fink says he hasn't heard from the Lieutenant Governor since he got that letter last Friday either, since her appearance at AFPAC. If she does reach out, he told us, he would ask her to sit down and have a real conversation about actual anti-Semitism. The kind that explains why on Friday nights and Saturday mornings, 
when people show up to synagogue or on Wednesday evenings for school, why they have hired an armed off-duty Boise police officer for security. They do it, Rabbi Fink says, because the reality is in the United States of America right now, Jewish institutions have been under attack with those attacks having become amplified over the last few years. He says if the lieutenant governor would really listen and really hear that, she wouldn't think twice about going to a conference where she appears to be courting white nationalists. Beautiful shot from Tamarack, and it's, it's getting close to the weekend, so let's talk about the weekend forecast, right? First of all, today, nearly 60 degrees, 62 at Mountain Home, 59 in Boise, so looking pretty good. Twin Falls even made it up to 61 degrees. Most of the mountains were right around 50 degrees is what I expect starting tomorrow, okay? There's changes coming in, and you see it right up through here. It's a very thin layer of showers, uh, but that is moving up toward the Weezer area and also could provide a little light snow for the McCall area. As we watch this move through, you see how it weakens before it moves into the valley. But if you happen to see a sprinkle, that's what that's from. Now let's move ahead and talk about Twin Falls because a storm forms to our south and it looks like it's getting into position to be a little further to our east, even though it's to the south there. It could bring in some snow for Twin Falls. If you're traveling down that way, there could be some spots with an inch to two inches of snow, but we're not really looking for much here in the Boise area. So when you look at temperatures for tomorrow, we're getting pretty close to 50 degrees. We're going to have plenty of overcast just like we had today. There's your 50 and 50 is a big number for Saturday and Sunday. Saturday morning, there's a chance of mixture of rain or snow, but that's getting less and less all the time. And next week, we basically dry out until the end of the week and we're right around 50 degrees.
All right, about a minute left in our show today on this Thursday. Let's take a look at your comments you sent in, like this one from Clarence. Where's the property tax relief promised by the Republicans? They're too busy micromanaging everything else in our lives. Hypocrites, 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 he says. Well, there is or has been a couple of bills with property tax as they're focused. They just really haven't done much with them. So they're out there, but they're just kind of floundering for now. Wait a minute. I thought the Republicans are in favor of less government, but our personal medical decisions and choice of reading material are in need of their governance, asks Sheila. We got a lot of text messages like this today about this whole, what about the least regulated state, yet we're trying to regulate everything like books and criminalizing librarians over maybe just some parental control or responsibility. All women do have a choice is what this is supposed to say. They have a choice to have an unprotected sex or not. That's the choice, says Linda in Nampa. I wish it were that simple, Linda. It isn't always that simple. Brian, regarding the anti-abortion bill, whatever happened to the federal medical right to privacy under HIPAA? That's a very good question, Ron. This thing has a lot of that in there. And it's, man, even, even a rape has to do with HIPAA. You have to prove that. It's all in the doctor. It's crazy. It's creepy that 666 library bill we're discussing. This is about censorship. That's all that is.